I V M. They swore in the new cabinet yesterday. I will faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter according to law. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to Bangladesh, and that I will not allow my personal interests to influence the discharge of my duties as a member of Parliament. Given that their very means of being there was based on an election where every rule had been flouted, the constitution abused to protect their personal interests. This oath was particularly perverse. They will sit in their duty-free cars, flags waving. They, the biggest lawbreakers in the land, will sit on boards and banks and schools. They will pass new laws. They took their oath as a mother of four was worthing in the hospital, gang raped by a party faithful for having the audacity to vote the wrong way. But yes, Arundhati, the tide will turn, and the nameless, faceless people will rise. They will rise against the entire state machinery. They will rise as they did in 1947. They who never clamoured for Mukti Jodha, freedom fighters' honour, who never claimed benefits for their children, who never wore mujib coats in public. They, their children, and their children's children will rise to bring back the core principles they had fought for. We will have secularism. We will have democracy. We will have social equality. We will win back this land. I'll see you in Dhaka. A humongous hug awaits. This is an excerpt from a letter written by Shahidul Alam to Arundhati Roy, which was published in the Guardian. Alam is a documentary photographer, and last year he was jailed for a hundred days, about three months between August and November 2018. His crime? He'd criticized the government on Facebook for their response to protests about road safety. Hi, you're listening to States of Anarchy, and I'm your host Hamsini Hariharan. This is a podcast about global affairs and foreign policy, and every week I tackle a new topic that will hopefully make more sense of the world we live in. The violence against journalists is not new, nor is it limited to Bangladesh. It's been a bad year for the press in South Asia. Every country has dropped a couple of places in the Global Press Freedom Index in the region. But what does that even mean? On June 16, 2019, in Islamabad, Mohammad Bilal Khan was stabbed to death. He was known for criticizing Pakistan's powerful military and the spy agency ISI. On May 11, 2019, Meena Mangal, a prominent Afghan journalist and political adviser, was shot in the streets of Kabul. In Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, and Maldives, the state crackdown on journalists has only increased. In an age of misinformation and technology-centered mobilization, journalists are easy targets for the powerful. My guest for today is the perfect person to speak about media freedoms in South Asia. Onohita Mojumdar is a veteran journalist who's worked across the subcontinent. She is the editor in chief of Himal South Asian. Himal is South Asia's first and only regional news and analysis magazine. In 2016, under immense pressure from the Nepal government, the magazine had to close down, and it restarted operations two years later in Colombo. I speak to Onohita not only about Himal's journey but also challenges to journalists across South Asia. But first, let's take a short break. Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I know that you guys are making fun of this promo on social media. Please continue to do so. That seems like uh, you know, as long as you keep listening, I don't care if you make fun of it. I wanted to again just reiterate: we're hiring at the best place in the world to work at. That's the IBM Podcast Network. We're looking for producers, content creators, audio engineers, developers, photographers, business people, all kinds of roles. Go check out our careers page: ibmpodcast.com/careers. We're really happy to announce the second season of Marvel's Lost and Found, which premieres on the 23rd of July. This season, Zen and Avanti cover issues like addiction, mental health, and kids, grief, eating disorders, and more. There are a number of special guests that will be on the podcast. Catch new episodes every Tuesday. On tech careers in the news, Sheila Ditya is joined by Shridhar Rajkopalan. He's the MD of digital and interactive platform at Accenture Technology. Also joining them is Marin Grace, the MD of Accenture Digital Delivery at Accenture Technology. They talk about extended reality, the interesting opportunities in this space, and a whole lot more. On Equity Sahiye, Anupam is joined by a very special guest, the co-founder of Motilal Aswal Group himself, Mr. Ramdev Agarwal. He talks about his fascinating journey from being a farmer's son to becoming an entrepreneur and a lot more. On Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch, Janice and Anirudh are joined by their very first guest, Purna Jagannathan. They talk about her recent casting in Big Little Lies and her experience working with Meryl Streep and Nicole Kidman. On What a Player, Mikhail is joined by Unni Nambudripad and Joel D'Souza to discuss and close the ICC Cricket World Cup 2019 and Wimbledon. On not just Tansa, Persan talks to culture and food writer Meher Mirza about the importance of articulating food stories rather than recipes. 
on advertising is dead varun is joined by gaurav lulla co-founder of loose cannons content studio they talk about the importance of brand communication and their mutual admiration for the brand nike on the pragati podcast economist anupam manu returns to discuss how dollar bonds would affect the indian economy and with that let's get you on with your show Hi Anahita welcome to States of Anarchy Hi Hamsini it's good to be on this platform as part of uh, my due diligence I actually checked out a couple of your podcasts and I found it really interesting so I'm also looking forward to listening to them frequently from now on Thank you that means so much to me So you worked all over South Asia I know you were in Afghanistan when the war was in full swing you worked in Colombo and Kathmandu with Himal I know you worked in India So I saw somewhere that you describe yourself as South Asian by temperament. Can you tell me what that means? I think uh, I find myself approaching issue from a wider perspective than perhaps just a nation state one. I think uh, our citizenship is a definitely a very important part of our identities, but we all have identities that uh, go beyond our citizenship and define us in many different ways. and the more i have reported on south asia i've come to understand how interlinked we are both in terms of challenges and contradictions and i feel the only way to really approach many of the issues is to look at it from a wider perspective so i feel like i'm very south asian in terms of the interconnectedness of peoples and the region Okay so did this south asianness come by itself or did it begin when you were reporting I guess it's a very long journey to becoming south asian and many parts I think uh, the first time I felt that I was not uh, defined by a very narrow nation state perspective is when I did reporting from difficult regions in India like Kashmir and uh, Punjab and i think uh, now there's some excellent reporting in the especially on kashmir but uh, at that time i think if you did not follow the narrative of the government of the day you were often targeted as an anti national journalist and that made me question this whole definition of uh, nationalistic journalism and uh, later on when i went to afghanistan to report from there uh the reporting on afghanistan was dominated by the western media obviously because they had troops there they had put in so much money there there was a huge presence and uh, i found that uh, my approach towards a lot of issues in afghanistan was very different from that of people who were coming and reporting on the place with a western perspective and i thought it was a very south asian outlook that i had on it you know because afghanistan was often very uh, stereotyped you know but they were looking at problems relating to women there or violence and uh, whenever i looked at problems i was uh, always felt that you know we have these problems too in different ways so it doesn't make afghanistan very unique and that's where i really felt very very south asian perhaps for the first time and felt that was my identity yeah i'm guessing you know whether it's things like women education just values and frames of reference there's sort of a similar footing that we have all over south asia i'm not going to equate the cultures as the same that's something that tends to happen sort of with the dominance of india in the region but uh, there are definite linkages and it it is easier to share a lot in common i guess with people from uh, countries in the region Exactly I think we share a lot our challenges are very similar and if you look at India as well I mean India is a country of so many cultures and so much of difference so I think you can be as indian in Afghanistan as you can be in uh, Sri Lanka in terms of uh, shared cultures and the cultures intersect depending on which part of the region we are in Yeah that makes sense i mean particularly within india because you have so many sub nationalities you often don't find things in common just with people from other parts of india so i don't know would it be fair to say the sort of multiculturalism can extend to countries outside india i definitely think so even in let's say the countries which are considered smaller in terms of geographical size or population I think many of them have extremely complex and plural identities within their country so absolutely All right so from Afghanistan did you move to Kathmandu Yeah that's right I moved from Kabul to Kathmandu So in 2011 right so was that to join Himal Uh it was in 2012 but yes uh, it was actually I moved to Kathmandu specifically to join Himal because 
the Himal had given me the kind of space that most media, especially in the region, and I would say India, were not willing to give me to report on Afghanistan. And just as an independent platform for journalists to report on things the way they see them, over the years, I became a real fan of the magazine. And I think the magazine was going through some uh, difficult times and uh, I was asked if I could come and help. And I thought I must do my bit to keep the place alive and going. And that's how I ended up in Kathmandu. All right. And how were the first couple of years when you were in Kathmandu? How was editing the magazine? How did you try to keep alive the space that you were fond of when you were a journalist? Uh, it's an interesting question because uh, all my life I had been a reporter. I had never taken on even managerial roles, you know, just shied away from it all. And then I landed in Himal with uh, zero experience in running an organization. And it was just really, I guess, sheer passion that I kept going and up a very, very steep learning curve. And uh, I think I also realized that if I wanted to do my bit to keep the magazine going. I also had to get into areas which we journalists usually shy away from, which is managing and fundraising and admin and (laughs) finance. And, you know, it made me realize that a lot of us, I think we want independent spaces to be kept open and uh, alive as long as possible. But we as journalists, we don't really want to go there because it's hard, you know, it's difficult. I still find it extremely difficult to do that bit. But if we are not going to rely on large uh, media houses alone, or we're not going to rely on, uh, let's say, the marketing department, or we're not going to rely on just, you know, typical managers, and we want these places to be vibrant, we also have to do that bit of work, which we don't always like. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, before uh, I started States of Anarchy, I was part of a very small uh, editorial team at this magazine called Pragati, uh, which was run by the Takshashila Institution. And uh, we were essentially a two to three person team figuring out everything ourselves, you know, right from social media to the editing, the commissioning. And uh, it, it does get difficult. And And I can see why journalists would also not want to take up that job because it is a lot more fun, I guess, to be on the field. Uh, But it is necessary also. Yeah, exactly. And you must have realized that uh, even when organizations are small, you know, the number of things you have to think about when you're running an organization, the number of things doesn't really minimize. You know, the scale is smaller than a large organization, but the number of things which go into it is uh, almost the same as running a larger organization, except that you're doing it with far fewer people. That is true. And far fewer resources in general. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I think another element is that uh, I think making sure that the back end, as it were, you know, that your admin and finance is absolutely impeccable, not only impeccable, but transparently impeccable in a demonstrable way. That has become so important uh, now because I think attacks on the media are increasingly targeting that factor. You know, I think Fewer and fewer uh, governments are exercising outright censorship because uh, censorship is, you know, seen as a black mark against a government. Uh, There's a cost for any government which is censoring and it's public and uh, people are documenting it and they're decrying it and they're making lists. But if you go uh, after an organization through its back end, its admin and finance, it's extremely low cost for the government which is censoring you. So I think that is becoming much more popular. That's true. And I think with a small organization, its biggest advantage, I guess, it's credibility, right? That's the only thing it has to go by. And therefore, it's very sort of imperative to have these transparent background processes so that if someone is coming after you, you have nothing to hide in that sense. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the thing is that most of us who are in this work and critical work, we are doing this work because of a passion for the journalism. So you're very ill-equipped to deal with the minutiae of uh, those processes of administration and finance. And yet you'd better do it because uh, I don't think journalism now is only about telling the story. 
That's true. I completely agree with you. It's, I think more and more, you know how we would see movies about movies. Journalism has also sort of become about journalism. It has its pluses and minuses, I'm sure, but it, it's also become about that. Yeah, that's right. And I think in this day of, you know, the post-fact world and fake news, I think there is an incredible imperative on all of us to also demonstrate what we are doing, how we are doing it, why we are doing it, so that there, if there, you know, people can draw lines between what is real journalism and what is not. I completely agree with you. Um, I want to get back to fake news in a while. But first, can you tell me um, what happened when um, you were the editor of Himal in Kathmandu? Uh, Himal was based in Nepal for about 20, 25 years, correct? Yes. So what happened? Why did you move to Sri Lanka? Well, we kind of uh, got caught in the crossfire, to so to speak. Uh, our founding editor, Kanak Dekshit, who came up with the idea and concept of Himal and ran it uh, almost single-handedly for uh, 25 years. Uh, he, as a civil society activist, had protested against certain corruption in higher places in the Nepali establishment. And because he was outspoken and unwilling to back down, when a person was appointed to the position in an anti-corruption office and he had opposed it. So as soon as the person was appointed, he went after our founding editor. Subsequently, the case was thrown out. Subsequently, this person was actually an impeachment process against him was started in the parliament against this anti-corruption czar, that is. But uh, by then, it it was too late for us. And uh, the way we were targeted was also, I think... uh, a little more unique than just people, you know, uh, investigating you or actually carrying out any actions against you. In our case, all that happened was that a range of permissions we needed from government authorities in order to operate, the permissions were withheld. So our files, which were with the government department, which regulated us, the files were seized by the office of this anti-corruption czar and they were not released. And this was for over a year. During this time, We were never investigated, let alone charged. I was never asked any questions about our functioning. They went over and over all our admin and finance, and they could find uh, nothing wrong. And all this was being done without a formal process. Uh, But uh, eventually, since the government uh, departments didn't give us permissions, uh, we couldn't continue. For example, we got a donor grant, and they didn't give us the uh, permission to use it. Now, in practice, a lot of organizations would use the grant and, you know, the process of uh, getting permission was considered uh, to some extent a formality and you could continue. But we knew that the minute we stepped out offline, they would use that to go after us. Uh, Similarly, with the visas for our non-Nepali staff, again, we know that a lot of people work in Nepal, you know, on uh, let's say, a tourist visa, and it was uh, there was never usually any problem about it. But we knew that if we didn't have all the paperwork in perfect order, they would find an excuse to go after us. So we finally felt we had no option. We know we're running out of staff, running out of money. Uh, we pay contributors every month. The banks were taking up to six months, four months to clear the payment to the contributors. So eventually we just we waited for a, more than a year for the situation to change. And then we realized we had to move on. So you guys moved to Colombo. Was it an immediate move? Were you able to just pack up and then begin operations from Colombo? Was there a time lag? Oh, there was a long time lag because... Uh, we had to set up an entirely new organization. We were run by a Nepali trust. Uh, so we had to set up a, a, a new nonprofit company in Sri Lanka, which, as you can imagine, took some doing, especially since we are not from uh, Sri Lanka and we had to find all the help and resources and people who would agree to be on our board. We also uh, initially looked uh, around the region to see where we would go. It, uh, Sri Lanka was not an automatic choice. Uh, but Yes, why Sri Lanka? I'm very curious. Well, I think uh, in India, uh, it's a, been a difficult political time for the media, not just now, but for the last few years. And uh, we have been very uh, fairly critical media. So we knew we were not going to get 
an immediate welcome. But the more practical consideration was that um, in India, you cannot get uh, foreign grants for media. Uh, we are grant dependent. I mean, and I hope with time that will change. Uh, but at that time and, and now we are grant dependent. And, uh, you know, under the FCRA rules, the media is not allowed to accept grants, uh, which I find quite ironic because, uh, you know, there can be international investment in media, which means ownership. But uh, we are not allowed to use grants. Uh, so bec- it's also ironic because political parties are technically allowed to get uh, money from abroad. I think it's uh, very curious why they will not allow media to uh, use grants. I mean, uh, why why can the media be partially owned by an international, you know, individual or company? Mm. Uh, does it is it because uh, let's say grants are usually associated with non profits who might end up being more critical than let's say a profit oriented commercial organization? I really have no clue, uh, but it's uh, quite strange, and especially now I think. If you look at, there are quite a lot of independent media flourishing now just in order to fill the gaps left by mainstream media, which is, you know, gone on a totally different route, which is a whole other story. Uh, but I think especially now when we're looking at nonprofit models, I think it uh, that needs to change uh, because uh, I think, uh, you know, sometimes you do need that kind of support. And as long as you're... I think the great thing about media is we are com- to some extent we're completely transparent because we are what we publish, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so what we do is in the public domain. So judge us by that, you know. Why, why would you? Uh, unlike a lot of other uh, areas where you know you may not be be able to see up front what that organization is doing with the money, etc. In the case of media, it's very clear what they're doing. So why aren't we being judging by what we do? I completely agree. I think a part of it is also because um, the traditional media houses are largely set up and often they're owned by people who belong to one or the other political parties. And so they have political aff- affiliations of one or the other. And the other thing is most media in India depend on advertising. And I agree with you by not allowing us to get funds from other sources, we're sort of stifling what we can do with our media. We're stifling innovation in media. Exactly. So how how does, let's say, an international grant compromise you any more than getting your funding from corporate houses? Mm -hmm. As the media, we're supposed to be reporting on the practices of corporate houses and the mainstream media is not only just completely subsidized by them, but media have also become extremely profit oriented. I mean, you know, the famous statement by the owners of Times of India in the New York article where they said, you know, we're not in the business of uh, media, we're in the business of advertising. Mm. Uh, And uh, I think a lot of people have this idea that there is something called free media. So very interestingly, we just did an audience survey because we want to try and launch, you know, membership plan to get our own revenue. And uh, in the audience survey, a lot of the people who read us, uh, well, the question was, you know, would you pay for the med- uh, for independent media? And they said, no, it should be free. But there is nothing called free media. Somebody's paying for it. Uh, the only question is, you have, as the reader, have to decide who you're comfortable with paying for your media. Are you comfortable with the government paying for it? Are you comfortable with the companies paying for it, the ad agencies paying for it, uh, the political parties paying for it, or do you want to, as a reader, contribute something? Yes, I think people in general, a lot of them still think as of journalism as a vocation. And they think, you know, it's sort of a noble thing that you do just because you should. Uh, but I don't realize they think that journalism at the end of the day to survive needs money. Um, And it's a pity if people aren't willing to pay for the news, then they're going to get uh, traditional mainstream news, which is just people yelling at each other and all their biases apparent. Exactly, exactly. At this point, let's take a break. How aware do you think you are of your laws and rights? Do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations? Do you know what your rights are when you're stuck somewhere bad? Well, here's a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are 
Tune into Know Your Kanoon with me Amar Rana. This is a podcast meant to answer all your law related queries. Catch Know Your Kanoon every week on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from. Welcome back after the break. You're listening to States of Anarchy and I'm Hamsini Hariharan. So you were saying you moved to Sri Lanka. Uh yes and then we uh, set up an organization which again took a long time and also because you know as a journalist I, I'm not an expert on any of these processes uh but we started uh, were able to start publishing again from uh, just over a year ago in uh, April last year uh, we are now completely online whereas in Kathmandu we had a print edition but uh, that for the moment uh, we are only online also largely because of the issues of distribution which has its own complexities as you probably realize uh and uh, we uh, after studying all of south asia we felt that uh, sri lanka had the enabling um, legislative and political landscape which would allow us uh, to move here and start without uh, too many obstacles and that did prove to be the case we also had uh, a group of dedicated readers and a very dedicated group of our regular contributors who made us feel very welcome and extended a helping hand you know and that's also i think something which is makes me feel very south asian that here we were in a way almost being if not kicked out forced out of nepal and a lot of people could have seen us as a political liability but every person who you know i spoke to saying would you come on our board to help us start was uh, there was absolutely no question they you know they didn't blink twice and they agreed and they extended practical help in terms of you know introducing me to people uh, you know uh, finding uh, everything from lawyers to chartered accountants who could help us set up the organization and i think that really again was part of the south asian spirit to you know to say hey if you can't do it here come here and we'll help you make it happen that's great i'm i'm very glad that you guys were able to move between countries uh, to set up office and this is actually the first time i'm hearing of a south asian spirit that works as you know camaraderie and companionship and i'm very glad for that but along the lines that you were talking about i also noticed uh, something that himal had done called the samdan himal initiative to track legal attacks on journalists yeah we called it the journalists on trial yes and we partnered with samdan on doing that because again as i said that uh, uh, while the direct attack the physical attacks the outright censorship is uh, fairly well documented uh, these days these kind of uh, using bureaucratic processes and legislative processes to go after media is not very well documented and we thought it would be good to start an initiative on that and so based on this initiative do you think things are getting worse for the media across south asia or do you think there are there outliers in general i think uh, the situation is getting worse if you look at uh, bangladesh and the ict act and you know how shahidul alam was uh, in a uh, jail for so many months under that act uh, if you uh, look at uh, the legislative processes in india again you know i refer to one and how fcra has of course precludes media but you know fcra is being used also for against uh, ngos you know withholding permission for people to get uh, grants uh, if you look at uh, Pakistan where you know we've been talking to a few Pakistani journalists recently and I think uh, while Pakistan has often we know that there have been red lines and restrictions especially when it comes to the Pakistani military in terms of reporting I think uh, the level of pressure on journalists on newsrooms has increased enormously over the uh, last year or so so i think the climate is definitely getting worse for uh, journalists and do you think this is sort of a side effect of the fact that elections have been happening across south asia you know between 2018 and sort of what will go till the later half of 2019 2020 i think uh, unfortunately i don't think we in south asia are really getting an enlightened leadership uh in our political sphere and i think there is 
in general, again, uh, not for every country in South Asia, but in general, there is a move towards greater authoritarianism in our politics. And I think that is definitely being reflected on the media. Of course, the media is, becomes one of the first casualties of authoritarianism. Uh, of course, Maldives has been an exception in terms of uh, how its citizens have really s- stood up mm. and, and taking enormous risk to uh, throw out their authoritarian leader and have a more democratic um, government in place. But by and large, I think there, uh, most of the region is uh, has uh, been moving towards a more authoritarian polity. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I was looking at the World Press Freedom rankings for South Asia, and actually all of them have fallen by a couple of ranks. The only country that has gone up about 14 places is Bhutan, and that's because I think they're sort of diversifying the media there. Uh, I was also listening to your podcast uh, that uh, Himal had done with Omar Varej on um, the increase of censorship in uh, Pakistani journalism. And I thought that was very telling of uh, what authoritarianism does to the media. Exactly, you know, and I mean, again, uh, the censorship is uh, getting recorded, but the fact that journalists are being uh, pushed out of the newsroom, people are losing their jobs, there is a use of advertising, again, which media have been dependent on, you know, you cut off advertising, you're basically cutting off uh, the live stream of a lot of media who are dependent on it. And of course, in Pakistan, we also have much worse uh, attacks, you know, direct attacks, people being picked up, uh, physical attacks, threats, people losing their lives. So I think it's quite a dire situation. Yes. And the problem with sort of authoritarianism and crises is also um, now you see an increase in Internet shutdowns for very simple, even local level conflicts, right? I mean, the terrorist attack in Sri Lanka, for example, I I won't call it a low level conflict, but that was one example. I think India is the country with the most number of internet shutdowns in the world. And that also directly affects your media. Exactly. And again, the internet shutdown is, uh, I think uh, there are a few organizations tracking it, but again, it's doesn't really make the kind of headline news, even though it has such a uh, impact, you know. And I think India, because it's seen as a democratic country and shutdowns are usually localized, uh, you know, to a particular region or a pro- uh, state. So uh, it doesn't really get, uh, um, you know, the kind of attention that uh, it uh, needs to get in order for people to actually start criticizing it. And in Sri Lanka, I must say that while we felt that it was had a good environment for us to reestablish ourselves, as colleagues here would point out, you know, there's continuing impunity for the terrible crimes against journalists uh, during the Sri Lankan conflict. I mean, those cases are still dragging on. They have not been resolved. Uh, the prosecution has been long drawn out uh, with the no end in sight. And uh, yes, I mean, actually, as we speak, uh, Sri Lanka is still in a state of emergency. Mm. And uh, internet shutdown is something which is not, I should uh, qualify that, not internet shutdown, but social media restrictions have been put in place several times uh, since I've come here. And uh, these attacks were only uh, one of the instances. Speaking of social media, there's also the beast that, you know, WhatsApp news has become the idea that misinformation um, is creating a lot of chaos and also lessening the credibility of um, media channels and media houses that exist. Right. I mean, just by editing simple photos or videos, there is a lot of outrage that's easily caused. And you can see this spiking during elections because political parties also use this to their advantage. But how do you see um, misinformation, uh, particularly in the South Asian context? I think it's really, really dangerous because uh, I think uh, this whole collapse of uh, media space into this mass where, you know, you have WhatsApp and social media at the uh, one end and you have uh, independent uh, journalists at the other and that people can't really tell the difference and people are just consuming a certain content, I will say, not media, not journalism, they're consuming the content which 
basically reinforces what they want to think and then it is labeled as news i think that's really dangerous also because in south asia i don't think we have enough safeguards against it mm. there is now for example i think there are organizations in uh, india i think it's uh, is it alt news yes, which alt is, news uh, does the fact checking on yeah and that they're doing amazing job of exposing these lies but uh, i don't know how far it's reaching and i think it needs to be much more structural and i think one problem in media is that i've been now a journalist for 30 years and i think at least uh, when i started journalism there is this thing that you know you you don't call out other media organizations there's this unspoken rule that you don't talk about um the bad behavior of other media organizations because they're kind of i don't know brothers or sisters in your same profession and i really think we have to change that i think it's as important to call out absolutely false fake journalism as it is to do good journalism um especially since if, if we look at a lot of the mainstream media and you know the talking or screaming shops that you were referring to i think uh, you know we don't need to opinionate uh, on a lot of these uh, tv shows let's just call them out on facts and we're not doing enough of that i think i completely agree and you would think that um a lot of the journalists would be the people who are sort of inserting civility into the dialogue but instead even if they are calling out each other it turns into sort of a mudslinging contest and no one's calling out the problem with the news that they're reporting they're just calling each other out personally exactly exactly i think and the thing is you know i mean we as journalists we are equipped with the skills to decipher fact from fiction we are equipped with the skills of fact checking we are equipped with the skills of investigation at the very least we are equipped with the skills of asking good questions just like the questions you're asking me now uh, so why is it that we can't bring this to bear or in a more structural way why can't we do more of it you know it, it doesn't take a lot to, to just ask questions of people who are peddling fake news in the guise of uh, journalism i completely agree and when i look at media houses who are most affected by the current atmosphere of um, not only censorship but as you had mentioned this sort of legal crackdown this bureaucratic crackdown on the media i think people who get easily left out are rural reporters do you think that's something that's true all over south asia or is that just in india no i think it's absolutely true all over south asia and uh, i think a lot of us including me we are very capital centric in uh, our ability to reach those people as well i think uh, the risks that uh, people in smaller cities and smaller towns who don't have those safety nets which all of us rely on you know whether it's a group of your colleagues or a group of friends or somebody you can call up in a you know a government office and get help uh, you can even make noise through media when you're in a bigger town but in a smaller places i think you are so much at risk uh, because you can't call on any of that and you know they are also not connected to us and this i think is our fault primarily that we are not able to reach out and make these connections in a more structural way in which you know we could become the safety net or at least a helpline for a lot of these journalists if if there was better connectivity we only think of them when we have to report a story you know you're landing up in a small town and you find out who's the journalist there and you call them up and you know sometimes they tell you the story and you just sit there and write it and then you get the byline in the big uh, media for your story and then you're off again and you don't haven't really kept in touch with them until the next time you want to do this next story mm. so much for solidarity <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, okay so we've spoken about a lot of think, things uh, you know on the issue of solidarity i i really it really troubles me because i look at other disciplines you know and like you you go for some meetings which are to do with human rights or you go to for a meeting of women's groups and you see all these friendships which have developed over decades between people from different countries as well and so 
I am actually so envious of it at times because I think our profession also makes us so competitive, you know, and uh, that somehow extends to not being able to really reach out to each other and uh, have uh, greater links of solidarity. So, yeah, I do find it really unfortunate. I agree with you. Um, okay, we've spoken about a lot of stuff that's damning about the press in South Asia. But tell me something that gives you hope. I think independent media houses, which are have come up against all the odds, I would say. You know, we've just talked about what it takes to keep uh, small organizations going. And, you know, we've talked about the in political environment in a lot of the countries. But if you look at how people are still going ahead and setting up new organizations, running them single-handedly. And I think what's really exciting for me is to see how many young people are being drawn to such organizations, you know, and uh, joining them and doing really, really courageous work. And if I just look at even, you know, I reported on Kashmir for a number of years and I really felt I stood out like a sore thumb during those years in terms of the kind of reporting I was doing. But uh, I think if you look at the media in India now, uh, the mainstream may have its own narrative, but I think there's an enormous amount of really good reporting. There's also an enormous amount of really in-depth reporting, you know, the skills which I don't think uh, we learned or we were taught uh, while we were reporting. It was so much more a news cycle, but people are going behind the news story now and reporting on issues which... Uh, during our time were probably, you know, we thought were too complicated to handle or there was never any appetite for those uh, stories. So I think the space is there. The platforms are there. Uh, The issue is, you know, how we can keep it going and how we can expand it. All right. And this is my last question for you. Um, If someone's interested more in reading more about South Asia, reading more of uh, good, maybe South Asian media, reading more about what's happening to the press in South Asia. What are some resources that you would recommend? I think in terms of South Asia wide coverage, we remain probably one of the uh, few platforms. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't think it's really widened. uh, And that's also why I feel it's important to keep us going. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, media now are paying attention even even to the practice of journalism. You know, if you look at India, you have the uh, wire, you have uh, uh, India Spend, which is uh, looking in, in depth into data. You have the scroll. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing a few. I mean, you have the incredibly brave caravan. I mean, hats off to them. I read each issue of Caravan and think, my God, you know, how how are they doing that? How are they still standing there and, you know, doing, uh, are part of this good fight? Uh, So uh, these are the ones which I'm familiar with, uh, which uh, the Hoot, of course, has changed, but I used to be uh, be a regular reader of the Hoot in terms of documentation of journalism. Um, These are the places I can think of off the top of my head. That's great. Thank you so much, Anoheda. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for the work that you're doing and best of luck. Thank you, Amsini. And same to you. And I look forward to hearing more of you in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks so much. That's it for this episode with Anoheda Mojumdar. Thank you so much for staying with us. It's becoming increasingly hard to be a good journalist in South Asia. So if you want to support magazines that do good work, then go over and donate to Himal or Scroll or The Wire or any small and independent organization that you think is doing good work. Subscribe to these organizations and you will be doing your part in building a strong fourth estate. That's it for this episode of States of Anarchy. If you have any comments or questions, then feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at the rate Hamsani H or on Instagram at the rate States of Anarchy. If you like what you listen to, then do subscribe to the States of Anarchy on the IVM podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're struggling to make sense of the headlines about international politics, I have a solution for you. On the last Tuesday of every month, I'm going to do a roundup of all international news that you should know about. The first news roundup is going to appear next week on the 20th of July. So do tune in. 
Hey, this is Shida Ditya, and I'm Amit Doshi, and we host Shunya One. It's a really fun podcast where we talk to some of the best entrepreneurs in the country. Yes, talking about everything from their startup challenges to what they're building and all the future of technology, right here. So catch us on the IVM Podcast website app or wherever you listen to your podcast from. Hello, everybody. We have a brand new daily podcast we're working on with Bloomberg Quint. All you need to know provides the top news on business, markets, and the economy, so that you can stay ahead of the curve. Tune in every morning on BloombergQuint.com, the IVM Podcast app, or wherever you get your podcasts from.